Well, it isn't very often a scientist gets the chance to work on a project that can change the world. So the expectation was that again this will be a rather dull experimental day. And I was actually the chauffeur of Atsimovic who was uh, driving him. I think that uh, this is uh, sufficient to say that the role of uh, Fusion Energy Conference in my career is very remarkable. Because of the limited communication uh, pre-internet days, uh, a lot of the results were shown for the first time at that meeting. No energy is more expensive than no energy. It is the year 1958. For the second time, the United Nations have invited the nuclear community to discuss the peaceful use of the atom. And it's during this week of September that history is written. After decades of research carried out in top secrecy behind both sides of the Iron Curtain, the status of work on controlled nuclear fusion is disclosed to the world at large. From now on, scientists are free to compare their results and share their doubts and expectations. This second Atoms for Peace conference marked the beginning of global cooperation and the starting point of the International Atomic Energy Agency's activities in support of nuclear fusion. All right, well, you know, in the early days, in the 50s, you had these big Geneva conferences on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy uh, after Eisenhower had announced his program of Atoms for Peace. And in those days, early days, it was more science. And we had something called the Scientific Advisory Committee, which consisted of very prominent scientists. Uh, Homi Baba from India was uh, one, one of them. There were, there were others, and it was natural for them to uh, recommend uh, that the agency be helpful in also promoting the emergence of fusion. So uh, that was the background why the agency came to be sort of framework uh, for this work and, and helping the fusion community. Soon after the Geneva Monster Conference in 1961, the IAEA convened an international conference on plasma physics and controlled nuclear fusion research in Salzburg, Austria. More than 500 scientists, representing 29 nations and six international organizations, participated in the first FEC. More than 100 papers were presented over the six days, and informal discussions lasted long into the night. I guess I, uh, I started to uh, my fusion career uh, by your one month uh, internship in the CEA, you know, the thing you do at, uh, towards the end of your studies. And uh, this was in a fusion group in, in CEA. And I saw the people coming back from the, uh, from actually um, a conference in Salzburg which I think was the first one, if I'm not mistaken. The first, uh, and I saw these uh, scientists coming back very excited from what they had heard uh, in Salzburg. And certainly that uh, uh, pushed me to try to know more about this. From now on, the international fusion community would meet in a different city, in a different country, every three years. At that time, this was before the days of the internet, and so the Fusion Energy Conference was a mechanism for people in the community to find out what the latest and greatest results were from experiments around the world. And there was a uh, healthy sense of competition where people, you know, would take their latest results, sometimes literally from experiments done the day or the week before the meeting, and present it at the meeting. And so it was a very informative meeting. 
Um, I remember all of us taking copies of the pa papers that were presented at that meeting, st sticking in our suitcases so we could study them in detail when we got home. Then came 1968. The third fusion energy conference was held in Akadem Gorodok, close to Novosibirsk in far out Siberia, a conference that changed the course of fusion research. And it so happened that this conference in Novosibirsk uh, uh, is actually uh, one of the most important ones. Uh, for what reason? Well, it's because it was the, uh, the conference where um, the Russian uh, team in Kochatov, headed by um, Lev Artsimovich, uh, actually gave very convincing details on the results they had obtained with their tokamak. For the first time, they had obtained one millisecond, which was nearly a factor of 10 better than anyone else, and obtained a, a kilovolt, which looks small these days, but was also a lot more than what had been obtained before. So we were all actually uh, uh, impressed by this. And I should say that Lev Artsimovich was a wonderful man. He had a, a great, uh, uh, wisdom and, and like international collaboration and he pushed internal collaboration and gave uh, all sorts of details. In fact, he did even better than that because he, he was invited by CEA at the time at Saclay, which is 20 kilometers south of Paris and was giving a series of lectures. I still have a book of this lecture and I attended this lecture. Uh, there were about 20 of us, I guess, um, uh, listening to, during one week, if I remember well, these lectures of Artsimovich. And here he told us the, uh, the fundamental aspects which we uh, remembered in, um, vividly uh, and they were extremely important uh, at the time. It follows from the formula that in a device designed for obtaining a very high temperature plasma, one can reach very high values of tau only if increasing the radius of a toroidal chamber, enclosing a plasma ring, and the strength of both magnetic fields, HZ and HI. As a, as a amusing anecdote, uh, actually, Atsimovich came to France. He, he came twice to France. One of these uh, time was in May 68. And you may remember that May 68 was also the time of the student riots, which actually paralyzed uh, nearly all France for a month. But still these, uh, still these uh, lectures went on. And I was actually the chauffeur of Atsimovich who was uh, driving him from Saclay back to the uh, Latin district in, um, in Paris, where he had a hotel. And it was at the time where uh, the, uh, the street in Paris were actually barricaded with uh, street cobbles. So I, so I had to, uh, to move Artsimovich toward this hotel at this time. And he, he turned to me and said, uh, look, Jean, I, for me, it's a great pleasure to see what a real revolution is. <laughs> uh, this is actually true, uh, an absolute true anecdote. Uh, so the, the lectures and the, and the papers published by the, the Russian group at the time uh, impressed so much the international community that it was a major change of the, of the research programs around the world. Um, so essentially the American, well, the, the first to react actually were, were the French group in, uh, in TFR for a reason that with the student revolution, there has been a big change in management. Actually, the, uh, the, uh, the scientists there uh, were called to express their opinion and to see how the program should change. So actually, the, the French group was the first one to, uh, to actually convert all their activities to tokamak activities and decided to construct uh, TFR which for a while was the largest uh, tokamak. But this, uh, the other labs did, uh, in, a, in a slow way, did the same thing. Uh, in Princeton, for instance, they turned a stellarator into the ST tokamak. 
uh, the Germans built um, uh, tokamak as well. Essentially, everyone built a uh, tokamak starting after this uh, 68 conference. So this was a major, uh, a major uh, milestone uh, for which we are still continuing into the, uh, into the same lines. Huh? Another anecdote, I think, which, uh, which actually happened in the, in, in the corridors of the conference in Novosibirsk is the fact that the, uh, you know, the Americans had built a, a larger stellarator and the stellarator was not giving very good results. Uh, at the time, they didn't know why. Now we know why. <laughs> um, uh, but so the, uh, the director of the Princeton uh, lab was uh, uh, Merville uh, Gottlieb, if I remember well. He has been the director there for nearly 20 years in, in Princeton. And he followed actually Lehman Spitzer, who is uh, very famous. The, um, so Gottlieb, I remember because I, you know, I, uh, I was sitting actually with them. And uh, I remember Gottlieb challenging Artsimovich and say, look, I think your, uh, what you think is one kilovolt temperature are only uh, runaways. Um, I challenge you to just put a wire in your tokamak and, uh, and your, all your runaways will disappear and your result will not be as good. Um, and, and I remember the, there was a very lively discussion there at the time. And, uh, and actually the, uh, the, the Brits um, from Cullum, um, uh, said, well, look, we have um, a new diagnostic, which is Thomson scattering. They were the first one, the Cullum group, to use the Thomson scattering and say, look, we propose that we will measure by Thomson scattering the, uh, the temperature, the electron temperature of the, uh, in, in, the, in the Russian uh, tokamak. And so they did. So it was during this conference, actually in the lobby, that it was, uh, uh, it was agreed that um, uh, a British team uh, headed by, if I remember well, by Neil Peacock and, uh, and, and Derek Robinson, I think was, uh, was part of that team as well, that this team would, uh, would come and measure independently the electron temperature using Thomson scattering. So they did, and I guess a year after, they did confirm that the, uh, the Russian had obtained the one kilovolt. And this contributed, by the way, a very uh, uh, a lot to the uh, to the new mood of uh, of turning to tokamak, which was called the tokamak mania at the time. Um. Well, the fusion world is in the doldrums a bit on fusion, but then the the Russians claimed that they were made big advances, and uh, a lot of the Western scientists um, didn't believe their results because they're such a jump, in fact, order of magnitude better results than anybody in the West was getting. And um, as a result of this, um, there's a Pugwash conference, which is held every few years, where top scientists meet and try and get the world to be more peaceful. And uh, Baz Pease, the column director, was talking to Artsimovich, who was the chief Russian scientist. And Artsimovich asked Baz Pease, well, he's talking to Baz Pease, and he says he, wasn't impressed, he was impressed by our diagnostics and would Cullum send a team to Moscow to confirm the results, as the rest of the world tends not to believe them. Anyway, Baz Pease agreed to this. It took us three months to actually, it was quite incredible, to build up the whole equipment. But we had the full resources of the Tom Genji Authority, which in those days included the weapons people. In fact, the weapons people built most of, our, most of the equipment for us, which was great help. And, and again, we had carte blanche for this, expense didn't come into it. And um, also there's the, the Americans chipped in and they let us have the latest um, photo detectors, which were still classified in those days, which, which we shouldn't have really taken to Russia, but nobody knew. And then on March, March the 16th, in 69, we, um, we had to fly first of all with the equipment. It actually was five tons of equipment but some of the equipment was very bulky, particularly the screen room. And we found that there's only one plane flying to Moscow that could accommodate this, and this belonged to Pakistan Airlines. And they're very helpful. They agreed to lay on 
They just asked, when do you want to fly? And, and they laid on the special plane for us with a special door. So that was quite a big exercise. So then we, we were off to Moscow. <laughs> anyway, it took us a, a few weeks to get all the equipment assembled. And um, then we had to fire up the laser. And we had to do this in the evening because it was, it was, we had to fire the laser in open, in open air, so to speak. So we had to go back in the evenings to fire the laser. And we had laser goggles on. And they wouldn't let any people in. And the security staff were frightened to come in anyway. So they left us alone. And after, after a few weeks, we started. they started firing the, the plasma. And we checked there was no background noise and things like this, basic checks. And then when it came to July, we had the first scattering results, loud and clear. And you will see from Derek Robinson's notebook, it says it indicates 1 keV. And that was the first indication that we um, had really succeeded. The first thing, well, there were two things. First of all, Buzz Pisa direct had to tell Harold Firth, who was the head of the American effort, he was waiting to hear the news. And as soon as the Americans heard our news, they they changed their all their machines, well, the main machines, to a Tokamak. And they did this within four months, they gathered. In fact, the whole world that was swung around behind Tokamaks. So that was the main effect of, of our trip. And also it led to the West doing the um, jet, obviously, and eventually ITER. And also, I think the other important things, we, we led the first of international collaboration against all the odds, so to speak. Perhaps these men will find a way to make the fusion fire burn longer. Perhaps they will find a way to make nuclear fusion a new source of energy for mankind. Well, it was, it, it was a time where both the, um, both the theory and the experiments um, learned their trade. Um, the, um, it was a time where um, a new instability was being discovered every year, or, or two or three, by the way. <laughs> um, and, um, and it was a time of uh, great disillusion on the uh, performance of the machines that were being constructed. Uh, you know pretty well that the, um, the expectation at the time was that due to the Coulomb collision, then we could have an energy confinement time uh, rather big uh, with fairly modest uh, size of machines. And that was uh, at the time what was coming from the, the, first, the first cut of, a, of, of theory. But then came all the instabilities. And soon the mirror machines uh, uh, suffered from so-called uh, anisotropy-driven instabilities. Actually, it was, the, uh, it was the talk I gave at the Novosibirsk conference, anisotropy-driven instabilities and how they were observed. Uh, and they actually killed the, uh, the so-called uh, mirror machines. And that's the reason why toroidal machines actually um, um, survived. Though it was a time where fundamental discoveries on the on essentially the stability of the plasma the collective stability of the plasma was being discovered both experimentally and and uh, theoretically and um, a major breakthrough is the the fact that the uh, actually uh, Kuskal Shafranov um, you know the uh, the uh, actually discovered the uh, how to stabilize the the large scale instabilities, MHD instabilities. And that was actually the, uh, why, the, um, why the tokamak uh, uh, performed so well, because essentially they had discovered that um, it, uh, one should not uh, increase the current in this uh, toroidal machine too much, otherwise you had large scale instabilities that would totally destroy the, the plasma. This, this is what's happening in Zeta. Zeta has too, far too much current, and, and the, uh, the results were uh, disappointing. But the tokamak, they had now a formula, which is the Shafranov limit, as you must know. And of course, all tokamaks now uh, respect the Shafranov limit 
that you know probably by having uh, Q greater than three at the edge or uh, uh, to prevent the large scale instabilities. Uh, in the mid 70s, you had uh, the high ion temperature results from PLT, uh, which you know showed that some of the theoretical concerns that instabilities would limit the ion temperature were unfounded, and we could actually get the high ion temperatures that we needed for fusion reactions. So there's been a series of events that have occurred in the Fusion Energy Conference that have created you know, moments of intense excitement. My opinion is that transition from dreams to reality requires uh, friendly discussions and uh, knowledge exchange between the best professionals in the field of the activity. Well, generally, of course, the, uh, the FEC conference w w has always been a milestone where, uh, where you, uh, major results have been reported and were sort of confirmed by the discussions. And one, I remember, say, half a dozen of them more than the others, uh, after Novosibirsk, I remember the Brussels conference in 1980. Well, essentially because uh, TFR had for the first time uh, developed powerful additional heating, both with beams and RF. And at the time we reported bad news, um, which was the degradation of energy confinement. So I remember that, um, uh, so we were actually the first one to show that in L mode the, uh, the confinement uh, degrades. And of course that was pretty, uh, pretty worrying. Uh, of course soon after the H mode came and, and the confinement uh, recovered. It just came without any expectations. So this was a Thursday and Thursdays were regular experimental days on Aztecs, the, the old Aztecs, not Aztecs upgrades, the predecessor of Aztecs upgrade. And uh, we always discussed the program on the Monday before. And for this Thursday, there was the plan uh, to explore again uh, neutral beam heated discharges. Uh, and this was my program. I was in charge of neutral beam heated plasma physics on Aztecs. And uh, nobody was very excited about this program because, of course, we had already done a lot there and more or less always encountered the same. So the expectation was that, again, this will be a rather dull experimental day where we ultimately recognize and confirm once and again that the confinement under these circumstances degrades. This these plasmas were extremely reproducible, and this was their only advantage. The negative aspect, of course, was the degradation of confinement. And this reproducibility was so extreme that, for example, when we followed the saw teeth and compared saw teeth then in the next discharge, then they were basically the same. So you could nearly predict, like with a clock, that now a saw tooth comes, how long it is, what the amplitude is. So high reproducibility but nothing else. And then suddenly, of course, then suddenly there was a drastic change. And this change was so strong in all plasma parameters that everybody in the control room noticed this. So the first reaction was, these are dirty discharges, uh, which have a lot of saw teeth. We mixed up the elms, later we called them elms, so the edge localized molds with the saw teeth in the plasma core. Uh, but this was the first response. Uh, my advantage was maybe that I was fairly, still fairly new in fusion, so that I did not have for each argument a counter-argument. Uh, and what I, I was surprised by the aspect that the loop voltage decreased after this transition in a period where otherwise the density increased and specifically also the impurity radiation, as we saw it on the soft extra radiation, also increased. So this, I felt, was something new. I had then, I had uh, analyzed these discharges then during the weekend uh, and then for the next meeting on Monday, uh, presented the results and then it became clear to everybody that we have hit 
something new, something we have not yet seen. And uh, we originally called these discharges on Thursday discharges because they came up on Thursday. The next day we also operated, this was Friday, we tried to reproduce it, but this was not successful, so the alternative then was called Friday discharges. Then on the next Tuesday, next week, we again continued and again we found the Thursday discharge. So we had the Thursday discharge now on Tuesday, uh, so this was not a very clever name and therefore we changed it then in the next step to A and B discharges. But then we recognized that this is not so clever either because we spent a lot of time to find out whether now the A type is the good or the bad one or whether the B type is the good one. Okay, so it became clear that we needed something which is mnemotechnically more elegant uh, and we called it then H and L discharges, uh, H mode, high confinement, L mode, L, conf L mode, low confinement. And this is the nomenclature which is uh, still used today. The first international forum to report on those results was in June 1982 and this was during the Varena Summer School. And I'm afraid I did not do a very good job and was able to convince the participants because I have heard then later that specifically American colleagues went back after our summer school and reported that the Astex team obviously measures the plasma current incorrectly. This of course was not the situation we were able to measure the plasma current as everybody else was. Uh, the next meeting then was in Baltimore, 1982, in September. Uh, and uh, I had an oral presentation, but it was the custom uh, at the IAEA meeting, because they had too many talks, too many topics, that one has one's talk on one side, and then also has to rapporteur on other findings of the machine. So in my case, I had reported on the H-mode physics, and I also reported now on behalf of other members of our team on specific neutron measurements on Astex. So the time was not sufficient now to satisfy, let me say, the curiosity of all the participants there. And therefore, it was Paul Rutherford uh, from the Princeton uh, laboratory who proposed whether we should not have a separate meeting in the evening and this is what then actually happened and when uh, the history says I was grilled this was maybe my feeling uh, so we had a couple of hours joint discussion which I remember was highly interesting and I forgot uh, maybe I was too nervous uh, whether I enjoyed this phase but it was a phase to indeed enjoy and at the end now of our discussion, Rich Horilok, another member from the Princeton University, came up, uh, congratulated, shook my hands. This was possible these days. Uh, and from there on, the age mode was acknowledged uh, and was now a player in the fusion community because shortly after this, the Princeton uh, device PDX and also the device uh, in San Diego, they both found the H mode also, and then shortly after this, also Jet, the largest device, was able to operate in the H mode. I, I remember in 1982, before we turned on those large experiments, that we were facing L mode scaling, um, which was adverse. Uh, we also were dealing with low beta limits on a number of experiments, and we were just discussing those results in the Baltimore meeting. Uh, and that there's an evening session that year when Fritz Wagner presented the H mode results for the first time um, in in the uh, more detailed than it was presented in the oral in, in his oral presentation, and we all saw there's a path forward uh, to increase confinement time. There was something so new; people had lots and lots of questions. And I remember going up to Fritz after the evening presentation and said, you know, he did a great job presenting the results. I was convinced. I told them that time that uh, you know this was a new mode of operation that had promise, and he actually made a very strong case that it was enhanced confinement. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, but 
the people were skeptical and trying to understand what this all meant is frankly the nature of science. Well, in 1985, there was a famous meeting between Gorbachev and uh, Reagan. And uh, that was the beginning of the early phase of the detente, actually. And um, they, they then agreed upon the project on fusion. So that was one feature of it. But for our part, more, even more important was then the, 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 the decision, the determination to come up with a huge project of fusion. Perhaps one didn't realize at the time how big it was, but there it was, and it has, it has worked ever since. Good morning, Excellencies. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to this meeting of the ITER Council. And in fact, the first ITER associated meeting since the formal acceptance by the four parties of the Director General's invitation to participate in ITER. Well, in those days when the ITER was started in the agency, uh, there were many interesting personalities, of course, who played a part in this. And I'm, I didn't meet, I met some of them. I remember distinctly uh, Jelikov, who was the deputy uh, president of the, of the Soviet uh, Academy of Science. Uh, fusion is not achieved the commercial step. And in such case, we have in very proper time to cooperate together. Because I hope after our cooperation, the result was the commercialization of fusion. The Elikov was very much part of that. And another person who was part of it was, and who really was responsible within the agency, was Maurizio Seferiero. He was the de Deputy Director General and Head of the Department of Research and Isotopes. A very skillful scientist. And he was also had another quality that was made him exceptional. He was a very good manager. He managed people very well. and. That's not always present, but it's very important, I can tell you, in international relations. So I stand in great gratitude to Maurizio Cifriero, who passed away a number of years ago. Nevertheless, this occasion is an important milestone in the progress of the ITER project. And it is appropriate for me to express, perhaps from a different perspective, the agency's views on fusion research in general, on the importance of this subject. Then, of course, I remember uh, Kyoto in uh, 1986, because in Kyoto 1986, it was the when uh, JET uh, showed that they had reached an H mode for the first time. So it was a demonstration that the H mode was a universal, uh, a sort of a universal uh, and very beneficial uh, uh, transition. Uh, so I remember this one. Uh, and it was certainly the basis for uh, pursuing the, uh, the tokamak research to, uh, to a larger scale. Then I remember Würzburg in Germany in 92, uh, because it was when JET announced the, uh, the result of the first DT conference. This is the first time then a fusion machine produced uh, fusion power. Uh, by putting a little bit of tritium in addition to deuterium. Uh, then I remember Yokohama. And Yokohama, uh, of course, this was in 98, where uh, Jet then uh, discussed the, um, uh, the DT2, so the full DT phase of Jet, where we, we reach uh, 16 megawatts. Uh, and where we showed a number of very important things on the physics that actually with tritium things were working uh, at least as well as with deuterium, maybe, maybe uh, somewhat better. Uh, and of course, uh, I had carried the uh, half of these experiments uh, myself as uh, an associate director. And that was something very, very important for me and I guess for the fusion community as well. Jet and TFTR were working on similar goals to do, and in particular trying to do the deuterium trading experiments. Uh, we got eventually to 10 uh, megawatts in 1995, and JET in 1997, we got up to 16 megawatts. During 1994 to 1998, 
while the crews of TFTR and JET achieved record-breaking results operating with deuterium tritium fuel. JT-60U achieved a performance with deuterium fuel equivalent in a simulation with deuterium tritium fuel to a fusion gain above one. The important part of that was not just the numbers in terms of how many megawatts which group prepared, but was the science that we got and the fact that we motivated each other on the science, whether it was studying the uh, uh, ion-induced total alpha modes or looking at the confinement time, looking at how it projected eventually to future machines and to ITER. Uh, all of that was the critical knowledge, which we did not have uh, going into the era of the large tokamak experiments in the 90s. Then, of course, in, in 2002, this was the, uh, the fusion conference was in Lyon. And actually, I was the organizer of this conference as the director of the, uh, as the, director of, uh, of the CEA laboratory. And it was also a time where um, the French machine called uh, Tor Supra, now it's called West, where it actually broke the record of uh, duration of, uh, of the tokamak plasma to six minutes. So I reported at this time also this, um, this thing. Well, when we went to the Chengdu meeting, that was the time for the first time we saw results from East. And it was very exciting that they were able to get the machine online so rapidly. Then finally, I remember well also uh, Geneva 2008, because it was a conference where we celebrated 50 years in fusion. Uh, and this was actually uh, moving to see that after the big conference of Atom for Peace, then we could, uh, we could summarize the progress which had been made since that time. Uh, subsequently, we had the meeting in Korea and we saw the first results from K-Star. So it was really great to see these new superconducting machines coming online, uh, following in the footsteps of Tor Supra, but now also including uh, uh, superconducting PF coils. Um, and in addition to that, we were getting in, in the 2000s results from both NSTXU and MAST, uh, both looking to study the science associated with low aspect ratio to get the higher beta and hopefully to take advantage of that to get to a uh, uh, more economical fusion reactor. So there's been progress in a number of fronts in recent years, uh, and all of that is needed to eventually address the issues of fusion energy. And another thing that has been going on, we heard the last meeting was the wonderful results from W7X and uh, also from LHD. And uh, starting in the Yokohama meeting in uh, 1998, and then in all the subsequent meetings and the progress that the Stellarator community has made. And uh, both of these machines have uh, really shown that there's a new pathway to optimizing fusion with the three-dimensional systems. And finally, at the 28th Fusion Energy Conference in 2021, another important milestone was the announcement of the JT-60SA Tokamak in Japan entering its integrated commissioning phase. This project, which started in 2007 as a collaboration between Japan and Europe, is presently the largest tokamak ever built. It will soon begin addressing key physics and engineering issues in support of ITER and Next Step devices. While magnetic confinement fusion research continues to progress, important breakthroughs continue to be made in other confinement technologies, including inertial fusion and alternative concepts with some of these efforts spearheaded by an increasing number of private companies and public-private partnerships. As of May 2021, 120 fusion devices are operating, under construction or being planned around the world. Of course, the, the most important next step is the uh, operation of ITER. So first, there is the need to succeed in ITER. It's an absolute must. But I'm very confident that it will be a success. But we should remind all the participants that they should do all their best for this to be, uh, to be a success. The Fusion Energy Conference has traditionally been an extremely important venue for people not just to discuss 
the science, and because there are many other conferences that can provide venues for discussing the science, but to discuss the future directions of the fusion energy program, both in terms of the overview talks on, as, and in the side discussions, the satellite meetings, to really map out where we as a community need to go to develop fusion energy. And, and it's thanks to this uh, um, collaboration culture that we have in fusion, which was actually started by Artsimovich. We should, we should uh, remember that. Um, uh, uh, thanks to this culture that we can progress much faster that if we were each doing this research alone, and, and I would say by a long way. At its uh, 60 years uh, age, Fusion Energy Conference remains uh, the greatest tool for organization of fusion community in solving very important environmental and energy problems of mankind. I wish it intrinsically a long life and happy life. Thank you. Now that the stage has been set and we all know the common challenge is to decarbonize and to do it fast, we need all viable technologies and fusion power holds the promise of providing us with infinite, clean and safe energy. So let's continue to work together towards this grand engineering challenge of the 21st century, achieving energy production from nuclear fusion. This is possible. Thank you for your attention.